Yeah. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Today we have another Speculative Evolution video. I've been going through these submissions as quickly as I can and there are still a lot to go, so expect at least one more video, possibly two more videos. I'm not even sure, it could even be more than that. Anyway, we now have eight more creatures from various authors, so no more waiting, let's just dive right into it. First up, we have Aphrodite. Aphrodite can be divided into three sections, the fruit, the stem, and the roots. The fruit evolved from branching leaves of more basal basio descendants. The fruit is filled with deadly toxins that would make it inedible to most creatures. The fruit takes on the shape of a satellite dish, extending from one side of the stem and curving up. The fruit of the creature still broadly serves as a photosynthetic surface for the organism, although it is poor at this function. The stem is long and spindly and takes up the majority of the organism's height. The stem is richer in violent pigmentation than the fruit and is the only edible part of the body. The stem is hollow inside and is home to many chemosynthetic prokaryotes. The plant gives the prokaryotes nitrite in exchange for glucose. The roots extract what minerals there are from the substrate and transport it to the chemosynthetic prokaryotes. Unlike many descendants of Bossio, Aphrodite has forgone the evolution of a tuber and no longer sends horizontal shoots from its rhizoids to spawn new stems. Aphrodite have no sex or other mating groups. Their typical form of reproduction is by budding. At about a year of age, they will start growing a bud into which they will transfer nutrients and symbiotic prokaryotes. After 90 to 110 local days, the bud will break away and drift some way away before anchoring itself into the soil with fast-growing roots. A typical Aphrodite will create a bud at least 10 times during its life. Additionally, the main plant's leaf retains the ability to reproduce sexually by releasing spores coated in a sample of its internal symbiotic flora. This only happens in exceptionally good conditions, however. Aphrodite can be found nearly anywhere in shallow waters, but they thrive at river mouths, especially near active colonies of bloomers. When a population explosion of bloomers occurs, Aphrodite is among the only organisms that thrive rather than dying off. Aphrodite has a strong resistance to bloomer waste products, and in fact concentrates them in the fruit to avoid being eaten. It also takes advantage of the high nitrite concentrations bloomers produce to feed its symbiotic prokaryotes. These situations also result in low predation. It should be noted that while Aphrodite benefits greatly from bloomer colonies, bloomer colonies do not significantly benefit from Aphrodite stands, gaining only a marginal benefit from the additional oxygen that the Aphrodite produces from its own modest levels of photosynthesis. Aphrodite depends heavily on minerals washed down from inland rivers. These form much of its tough structure and are used to help feed the chemosynthetic prokaryotes it depends on for a large portion of its glucose production. It also benefits greatly from high nitrite concentrations, and so they grow most where bloomer colonies are thriving. Creature Design by Jura Next we have Bomite. The Bomite is clearly related to Bobert, from which it evolved. However, it has undergone significant modifications. Perhaps the most significant modification is a double-hinged set of mandibles. The jaw is supported on the proximal portion by a cartilage rod, but the distal portion is covered in a calcified shell, similar in composition to mollusk shells. The double hinge on each mandible makes it so that they can be moved laterally, but also back and forth in a sawing motion. Another noticeable change from Bobird is that the cephalization, seen only slightly in the primitive Bobird, has advanced considerably in Bomites, who now have a flexible neck region. Also, the head and abdomen have separate calcified shells, and the distal pair projections on each limb are also now covered in a calcified sheath. The dorsal shells are used for defense against predators, and when threatened, the bomite will burrow into the substrate, leaving only its shells exposed. The last major change in bomites is that the posterior gill has now been internalized, and respiration is achieved by rings of muscle around an interior unpaired lung, with several air sacs branching laterally from it, with their own sphincters to increase the velocity of water exchange. Bomites are sequential hermaphrodites, although the majority of them will never actually shift to the second stage of their reproductive life. Bomites live in colonies of up to a dozen individuals, all but one of whom are male. The oldest and largest bomite is the only female. When she dies, the remaining males will wrestle for dominance, with the winner becoming a female. Eggs are laid twice a year, in spring and autumn. Bomites hatch as tiny versions of adults with no shells. They grow mostly asymmetrically, with their shells developing in layers as they go. By a year old, they are nearing adult size, and will settle with a colony of conspecifics. Before this, they are itinerant, wandering about, eating what they can, and most of them, themselves, being eaten. Bomites are found in temperate shallows around Natash. They are intolerant of very high or low temperatures. Bomites are generalists, and will feed on just about anything their saw-like mandibles can cut into, including rock fruit, retinal fights, carrion, etc. They rarely kill living prey, preferring to saw off a chunk and make their escape before any resistance becomes too extreme. 
They can move their mandibles quite quickly, so they are generally successful in at least getting a small chunk of food before their food source even realizes something is amiss. Bolmites live in colonies of up to a dozen individuals. They will feed in loose groups and dominance is established by way of non-lethal wrestling matches. The dominant individual in the group is always female. Other than the ability to release alarm pheromones and safety in numbers, the groups do not have any particularly close social interaction, as they are too unintelligent for complex social interactions. Bomites aren't the stupidest creatures on Almaisha, but they aren't going to win a Nobel Prize anytime soon. With the reconfiguration of the anterior anatomy, the antennae have taken over most chemoreceptive roles, although the mouth still has limited chemoreception. The antennae are still the primary tactile organs. The eyes are better at resolving images than in Bobird, but still not amazing. While Bomites are essentially deaf, they can pick up vibrations through their lens. Creature Design by Dapper Dino. Now we come to Ecoglobes. Ecoglobes have developed two main specialized organs which differ from their ancestors, the filter globes. The first is specialized tentacles. Of the eight, six have developed the seven protrusions on the tentacles to be more sturdy and flexible, and slightly longer as well, with four hair-like follicles protruding from those main protrusions. The other two have evolved the protrusions to be closer to the end of the tentacle, bunched up and being equally as sturdy but less flexible. The ends of the tentacles also have muscles at the end which expand and contract at opposite ends, allowing the ends of these two tentacles to act as claws which open and close. The second specialization is the gills. They have evolved to have a total of 20 chambers. Each quadrant of the creature has one main chamber which extends up the length of the bulbous dome of the creature. On the lower area, on each side of this chamber, are two more chambers, making a total of five chambers on each quadrant. The two chambers which are bunched together in the top chamber act to expand and bring in fresh water, which is then moved to the large main chamber, and in the lower chamber, to expel wastewater, which has been deoxygenated. This allows for respiration, but as an added bonus, these main chambers can be squeezed to force water out, which allows for propulsion in a certain direction. The rest of the organs include eyes, mouth, stomach, reproductive organs, hearts, and a brain. The eyes have grown to protrude more outwardly from the body, allowing the creature to have a more focused vision in a certain area. This can allow the creature to see a predator coming, or to hunt prey. The mouth of the creature has been extended from the main body, it consists of four jaws, which have a more sturdy casing than the rest of the body. The jaws can open and close at will with the aid of muscles at the base. Above the mouth is the stomach, which has another muscle allowing the throat area between the mouth and the stomach to open or close at will. The stomach also has a layer of muscle surrounding it, allowing the stomach, in coordination with the mouth and throat, to suck in water from the vicinity of the throat. Usually this will allow the creature to inhale its prey and lead it into the stomach, where all digestible items will be digested. The rest is left in the stomach, and when all that can be digested is digested, the stomach will be squeezed by the surrounding muscles to expel all waste left over. The hearts and brain of the creature are much the same as in their ancestors. The body of ecoglobes consists of a soft, spongy tissue which is very lightweight and squishy. This means ecoglobes are easy prey for other creatures, but if they survive, they will be able to regenerate extremely quickly. The horizontal diameter of the balloon of the creature can be as large as more than a foot. Ecoglobes use a spawning mechanism modified from the ancestral broadcast spawning. When the gametes are expelled, they get caught in the tentacles of the creature. During the mating season, any number of creatures will entangle their tentacles, allowing for multiple genes to pass into the next generation. Some may come from the same parent and will be more or less clones, while others may have a wider diversity of genes. The young ecoglobes will cling to the parent they originally rested on. They may consume smaller creatures which inhabit this area, and may also be consumed by larger creatures that sometimes wander in. However, because the creatures spawn by the hundreds per individual, much of the generation is kept alive, usually surviving to numbers around a dozen or even fifty before reaching maturity. Upon reaching maturity, the ecoglobe will finally detach from its parent and will begin its own life. Ecoglobes could be considered mini-habitats. The smallest fibers of the tentacle of the ecoglobe are able to entangle microscopic organisms, which are consumed by larger organisms, which are consumed by yet larger organisms, and the young ecoglobes. These are then consumed by larger organisms which the adult ecoglobes feed on. An ecoglobe's tentacles are oftentimes entangled with spiral plants growing around them, allowing for Kerber to swim around in them and hide from predators. Aside from this, the ecoglobes use their lightweight and large balloon to float to the very surface of the ocean, sometimes slightly lower. Their main habitat is the coastal areas of the northern Natasha Peninsula to the coastal shores of eastern Cha Tang and the southern shores of Arctica. Ecoglobes live in ballons very similar to their ancestors. However, a single ballon may contain about 20 ecoglobes at one time, on average. Creature designed by Lord of Leviathans. Now we come to Ferox. In the midground, a male Ferox Movacoroi exposes itself on the surface in order to find a mate. He has found a potential partner, the large, still buried female in the foreground. This illustrates the relative size difference, a rather extreme example of sexual dimorphism at a time when such things are rather uncommon on Almaisha. Ferox has retained much of the biology of its ancestors. 
but due to the rise of predatory pressures and new niches being open, they have adapted to a new role in the environment. Ferox has adapted to be an ambush predator, hiding under the sand. Their eyes are now positioned on the top of the body, and their legs have turned into a spade-like appendage. While good at digging, it is difficult to use for locomotion. However, they are still of necessity able to support their full weight on the surface. Their bodies have become wider and flatter to ease the task of digging, although the stomach can expand to accommodate larger prey. The proboscis has been enlarged to the point of being a third of the total body length. This in turn allows it to have greater suction power to catch passing prey. Within it are lines of barbs. These are used to stop prey from escaping and to kill it, without putting the predator in danger. What were antenna-like appendages have been lengthened in order to stick out of the sediment, and at the end of each are protrusions made to resemble the plant material surrounding them, akin to lures. The only way to identify one among plant matter at the bottom is by searching for the characteristic gill-like plumage. These organs stick out of the sand, since at this time there is no creature that correlates them with danger. When it's time to reproduce, males of the species will search for the buried females. However, they must be cautious with the approach, for the females are twice as large and will gladly make a meal out of the opposite sex. In order to both be able to reproduce and keep the female from eating him, he will do a display with his modified appendages by inflating them while waving them out in front of the female's exposed eyes. This may take minutes to do, and 8 out of 10 attempts end up with the male being eaten. However, if they are pleasing to her, or she's just not hungry, the female will dig herself out and allow the lucky male to fertilize her eggs. This is done by the couple transmitting gametes internally. The male has evolved a specialized diversible intermittent organ that allows him to transfer his gametes directly to the female gamete chamber. A few weeks after mating, the female will release a string of fertilized eggs into the water, where they will be on their own. At the same time, the lucky male will undergo a transformation, becoming a large female, becoming a large female, and then it will be its turn to attract would-be males slash meals. Like most pseudotetrapods, the young hatch as essentially miniature adults and grow mostly isometrically. Ferox are often found buried, with the only signal of their existence being the gill-like organ on their backs. These patient predators are often found among or near their prey's food source, each having adapted lures to mimic them for greater chances of success. Most species prey on protomysanids. Although they have great eyesight, the creatures have yet to develop the brain power to link the weird protrusions on the sand as danger. While protomysanids are the main food source for ferox, they will eat anything small enough to be eaten, often cannibalizing on smaller individuals of the species. The distal end of the trunk and the antennae slash lures remain quite sensitive to sense and pressure differences. Additionally, the eyes are more advanced than in Bobur and are sensitive to movement, although their ability to focus is a bit limited. Creature designed by Deported One. The feather bush has evolved from the juvenile state of its predecessor, the fractal tree, finding more benefit in searching for nutrients rather than waiting for the nutrients to come to them. In order to aid forward locomotion, its leaves have lost their appearance in favor of a set of dual tendrils, allowing water to flow around and through them, which in turn allows the feather bush to much more easily swim through the water, while still having the ability to sense available nutrients in its dark home. Pictured here is a swarm of feather bushes approaching an active hydrothermal vent. The large tendrils of the feather bush still share the same purpose as the leaves of the predecessor, finding necessary nutrients, such as iron, copper, silica, aluminum silicates, aluminum oxides, zinc oxides, and different forms of uranium ore, dissolved in the water it swims in. Instead of allowing digestion to take place on the outside of the body, it has internalized the process of converting ionizing radiation into metabolic energy. Filtering the water in its frontmost chamber and implementing the necessary reaction in its guts, along with extracting minerals required for growth from the water. The bladders once found on the surface of the fractal tree have subsequently been internalized into a single bladder. Electrical current gathered in digestion is now stored in a central organ, allowing for the accumulation of energy required for movement. In order to reproduce on the go, the feather bush has partly forsaken the pure asexual reproduction of the fractal tree. Instead, they develop both male and female gametes in the body near the end of the digestive system. When they encounter an environment with aluminum phosphate, a group of feather bushes will release their accumulated gametes, which will find each other in the water and develop into a planktonic organism with nothing but a mouth, a small gut, and two feather-like tendrils, which it uses to both paddle through the water and flick some nutrients into its gut. After about 48 hours pass, it will use the nutrients stored in its gut to form into the second stage of its life cycle and its namesake. After a local week, it will have grown into a single adult budding form. From this single adult, several others will bud, each one with the organs of the free swimming form only instead sharing electricity to enhance the growth of others. In a period of anywhere from one local lunar cycle to several local years, the budding forms will split off into a juvenile free-swimming form. After 48 hours, the extensions of the tendrils will atrophy. Its body will also grow in length to accompany a proportionally long tail, fit for swimming. After it has developed into an adult, it will begin to search for other sources of aluminum phosphate to release its own offspring. Feather bushes live in the same regions as their ancestors, in the deep ocean where thermal vents are present, providing a food source. They travel between the thermal vents present in the ocean, reproducing when the current environment is sufficiently hospitable. 
Creature designed by Jomo221. A tiny Kerberb swims among the tentacles of an ecoglobe. The Kerberb has ten segments on its body, like its ancestor. There is limited tagmosis in the first three segments, which are somewhat cryptically divided. The foremost segment has a mouth, while the end segment contains the anus, where waste is removed and reproduction is done. Every segment contains two eyes, a pair of limbs, and a pair of gills, except for the frontmost segment, which has entirely lost its limbs. The second and third segments have large, flat limbs used like paddles for faster swimming. The ninth and tenth segments also have large fins. Every other segment has smaller fins, which are used to aid in swimming. Kerberb live in the Ecoglobe Ballon ecosystem, using the foliage of a spiral plant as both a food source and covering against predators. Kerberb will paddle with their two pairs of anterior limbs, rowing them in a circular motion to propel themselves forward. The limbs on their sides are used mainly for steering and quick maneuverability. The limbs on the end, which form a sort of tail fin, are flapped with the entire body up and down, creating even more boost. Overall, this creature is extremely fast. The Kerberbs feed on small chunks of plant matter and the microorganisms on them. Kerberbs' eyes have advanced, allowing for them to sense motion in the light, which can be used to escape predators. However, this is the extent of Kerberbs' visual acuity. Creature designed by Lord of Leviathans. Not quite last, we have spiral plants. Spiral plants are purple photosynthesizers, which can have many leaves on a single stem. Spiral plants have many small leaves arranged in a spiral pattern around the central stem. This allows the organism to more efficiently catch sunlight for photosynthesis than a single leaf. The long stem is flexible and has air pockets within to help it float in water. This allows it to grow much taller than it otherwise would be able to. Its roots do not grow out to make a large network like other retinolophytes. The spiral plant roots only reach about 10 centimeters from the base of the plant. Reproduction is asexual. New organisms are formed from parts of the plant being broken off and landing in a new spot, where it can grow a new root network into the ground. The plant becomes more likely to break as it grows, meaning that once fully grown individuals have formed in an area, they end up scattering many new individuals around them. It takes about 80 hours for a new plant to grow from a small piece landing on the substrate. It takes a much shorter 40 hours for any damaged organism to regrow the most of the stem. This all assumes water which is rich in nutrients. The less nutrients in the water, the slower the plant grows. Spiral plants grow near shore, but because they rely on buoyancy for their structure, they do not grow in the intertidal zone. The main habitat of spiral plants is the coastal shores of the northern Natash Peninsula, to the coastal shores of eastern Cha Tang, and the southern shores of Arctica. Creature Design by Balathal Last, but certainly not least, we have the water hoppers. Water hoppers are descendants of filter globes. In response to the large-scale evolution of predation in the seas of Almayesha, water hoppers have developed an extremely limited form of flight based on water jet propulsion to escape predators, which they use in a similar manner to flying fish of Earth. They launch themselves into the air with their water jets and continue to propel themselves with the jets for a few seconds before running out of water, after which they can then glide for a few more seconds, with the longest flights lasting up to 10 seconds and carrying them over 10 to 15 meters. They have some limited directional control while mid-air, and are able to make minor targeting adjustments by using their rudder tentacles and fin wings. The waterhopper lives in coastal waters, with many species spending much of their time in tidal pools, especially in the early stages of their life cycle. They use their ability for flight to hop from pool to pool when the pool they are in runs out of oxygen or food or has a predator in it. Thanks to this, they have access to a safe haven from large predators, as well as access to unexploded food sources such as algae and small trapped prey. Diet-wise, waterhoppers are generalist scavengers and eat plankton, algae-like single-celled retinal phytes, loose food particles, carrion, phytozoa, and smaller sessile shelled creatures. They do, however, sometimes hunt small free-swimming creatures as well. Waterhoppers travel in schools of anywhere from 5 to 50, usually traveling in larger schools when in open waters. Pictured here are two waterhoppers fleeing underwater danger off the coast of Ras al Kalb. Waterhoppers vary in size somewhat, but are generally no bigger than 20 centimeters long. The waterhopper has its mouth and eyes at its back end in a direction it can't travel very fast, so it has to make some adjustments. The eyes of a waterhopper protrude on fleshy mounds to allow it to see past its body, and its two lowermost tentacles come forward, allowing it to catch prey as it chases. These two tentacles also serve as landing gear and a means of pulling itself to the nearest pool of water should it miscalculate a jump or find itself on land. Its two topmost tentacles serve as tail-like flippers in the water, and as a directional rudder while in the air and its remaining four tentacles serve as feeding appendages. Its mouth has also developed four hard teeth to help it crush small shelled creatures. As predation became more and more prevalent in the seas of Almayesha, evolutionary pressure drove the soft-bodied filter globes to become faster and faster to escape predators. The body flattened out, becoming bilaterally symmetrical for added hydrodynamics. The musculature of the water jets increased, and the main air sacs connected to the water jets. 
This mixture of water and air allow the organism to create a bubble screen when using the jets underwater. The air must be refilled at the surface after use. For more constant long-distance swimming, as well as for steering, the rings around the abdomen lost their air and developed muscles to allow them to be used as simple fins, and the sides of the bubble sac flattened out and developed muscle as well. Four of the eight tentacles became powerful paddles. Lastly, some cartilaginous supports evolved in the fins and air sac. This early water hopper already spent much of its time near the surface, both so it could refill its sac and so it could hunt its planktonic prey, which also mostly dwelt at the surface. So on being attacked from below, it was inevitable that some water hoppers would jump out of the water in an attempt to escape, and thus natural selection kicked in, choosing whoever could stay out of water the longest. The reproduction cycle remains mostly unchanged from the ancestral filter globes, though they now spawn in tidal pools where their offspring will be safe from most predation. Like their ancestors, the offspring's jet muscles are underdeveloped, and thus they are stuck in the pool when the tide goes out. This leads to fierce competition between siblings, and of the hundred or so offspring a mating pair might produce, many will starve and become food for their brothers and sisters if they aren't eaten by an adult water hopper first. Once their jets develop after around 30 local days, they will venture out into open waters, though they will frequently return to the pools as adults to hunt and breed. Creature Design by Sean O'Donnell Alright, well, that's it for this video. We had some really cool creatures this time, and I am looking forward to the next one. I've already started to look into some of the submissions that I'm going to be adding. Some of them are pretty cool. So remember, so remember, hit like if you liked the video, subscribe if you haven't already, so you're always up to date when there's new Diaper Dino stuff. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to thank my patrons, especially my $20 and above patrons, Van Tovind, Ian Chen, Speed of Sound, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, and Bob Knob. My patrons help me keep this channel going, because as you may know, YouTube is a very volatile platform. If you'd like to help out, my patron tiers start at only $1 a month, and it automatically gets you access to the exclusive patron-only Discord server, as well as early access to my videos and voting for what next topic should be. For example, my patrons tend to be the ones who decide which episodes of Things That Aren't Dinosaurs I'm going to do, as well as sometimes who I'm going to cover next in the next debunking series. If you feel like a monthly donation isn't right for you, but you'd still like to support the channel, remember, every like and share and comment helps the channel. But if you'd like to help in a more material way, I do have a wish list for Amazon.com, and a Teespring store. Links in the description. Thanks for watching.